Our friends at Perla are big proponents of simple, long-term investing, and now they're rewarding you for being a long-term investor too. Perla investors receive points every time they fund their account and invest. The more points you earn, the higher your chances to win one of their weekly prizes or the big prize at the end of the month. To get started, check out the competition terms and conditions and open your Perla account today using the links in your podcast player. This episode of the Australian Finance Podcast is proudly supported by GlobalX ETFs and the launch of the US100 ETF, better known as N100. N100 offers Australian investors exposure to 100 of the largest non-financial companies listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. N100 focuses on innovation-driven companies, providing a growth tilt to core portfolio holdings. You can learn more about N100, including reading the PDS and TMD by clicking the link in your podcast player or by simply heading to globalxetfs.com.au. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Liz, thanks for taking some time to join me on the Australian Finance Podcast. My pleasure. Great to be here. Um, It's wonderful to have you on because we're just talking off air that the costs of having a pet, adopting a pet, um, buying a, a, a kitten or, or a puppy. Um, these are things that we sometimes don't factor into our daily lives and our finances because we're so emotional and we're, we're just thinking about all the joy they're going to bring to us. Um, so this is actually a real thing and I'm hoping we can dive into that. Um, what I was actually hoping to do at the beginning of the show is actually just actually a very cheeky question. Would you say you're a cat or a dog person? Oh, that is such a cheeky question. Um, I'm probably, I'm, so the right answer for me is to say both. And I think I am both. I have, um, I have a a Labrador called Princess Esther the Great and uh, two cats called um, Mummy Cat and Ready Cat. Um, um, So I'm both, but I'm also a real pragmatist. And um, uh, during my life when I haven't always had uh, the, uh, you know, a house or a yard or or I've been a bit busy. The one animal that I um, am always with is a cat. So okay. when push comes to shove, um, I'll always have a cat mm-hmm. um, because they are, um, uh, they're, they're wonderful for your life and they are easier to own than mm. dogs. Mm. Especially, especially I, I lived in an apartment for a few years. I, I really wanted a dog because I grew up with dogs, mm. but um I, I know that in an apartment, it's probably not the ideal lifestyle for the animals. So a cat was definitely something uh, that we considered. But we ultimately, Liz, we went with a we went with a rabbit. Um, yeah, perfect. You know, it was wonderful, but uh, it did end up chewing the architraves of the rental that we were in. So we mm. have to do a little bit about that, but that's okay. Um, maybe to start off with, I, I imagine almost every single one of our listeners is familiar with the RSPCA, but maybe you can just explain to us what the RSPCA is and and basically the role that you fulfill in society today. Sure, thank you. Well, uh, RSPCA in Australia uh, is made up of RSPCAs in every state and territory and they're all separate entities. And there's also RSPCA Australia, which is like our our, um, federated body. Um, What RSPCA's purpose is across the board uh, is to... Um, make lives better for animals, to end cruelty and to help improve the standards of animal welfare across the country. And also that includes helping people, individuals to care for their animals better as well. Um, The way that we go about doing that is that we use the science. So we're based on animal welfare science and data. Uh, There's, we've been around for 150 years uh, and, um, Uh, there's a huge amount of evidence around what good animal welfare looks like. So that's the basis for it. In terms of what we do, um, uh, across the country, we operate uh, uh, shelters and take in over 100,000 animals a year. Uh, uh, So around about um, uh, 40% of those are cats, about 20% of dogs, and the rest are other animals. There'd be um, a lot of horses, a lot of rabbits and guinea pigs, but also every other species, um, including a lot of wildlife too in some, in some places. Each state is a bit mm. different. Uh, so we, um, uh, we rehabilitate those animals and rehome them. 
Um, in addition to that, in um, every location with the exception of the Northern Territory, we enforce the law. So the oh, RSPCA, right. and that's a really big role for us. So RSPCAs, uh, as I said, with the exception of Northern Territory, have an inspectorate. Uh, that They enforce the uh, state-based uh, laws around animal cruelty. So uh, uh, an indication, uh, there's over, across the country, over 73,000 animal cruelty reports come in annually uh, and our inspector teams go and um, go and address those. So, hmm. um, so that's a really, 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 really important role. In Victoria, our role in that space um, is around companion animals, including horses. And so, uh, and we, we respond, our inspectors respond to over 10,000 cases a year and, um, and we prosecute around, uh, around about 100 cases a year as well. That's a really important role for us. The other, um, the other two areas that we do is around um, uh, education, community, education and community outreach, lots of education, uh, uh, talking to primary school students, running programs face-to-face -face using digital uh, technology and also a community outreach in uh, to varying extents around the country so supporting um uh supporting vulnerable communities to make sure that they can get their animals mm. well cared for and also roles in family violence um and um uh, you know, people who are homeless and what have you and just making sure that people can um uh, care for their animals in the way that they need to or if they can't care for them um helping them to uh, surrender them and giving those animals a second chance mm. uh, and the final piece is uh, is advocacy so that's really really important so we work with um, governments and industry using that science and evidence to mm -hmm. improve legislation and rules um, uh, around around animal welfare. Good examples are uh, we're um, on the cusp of getting hens out of battery cages. So there's over 10 million hens right. in battery cages in Australia at the moment. The standards are being redone. We're hoping that this year um, that the um, that all the governments will agree on a phase out of, of battery cages so that those um, those chickens don't suffer anymore. Another one is live export um, uh, improvements in racing codes and things like that. Yeah, right. So uh, two follow up questions on that really quickly, if I may. How is the RSPCA funded? That's a great question. Uh, so um, uh, abundantly funded through the generous donations of the community. So uh -huh. uh, I I'm best able to talk about Victoria. So in Victoria, we're 70% funded through donations. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so that is um, you know, the community. We know that um, uh, we, we hold a really, um, we're very humble about the place we hold in uh, the community's hearts. We know that we're sure. trusted uh, and, um, and that people have confidence in us and they, they demonstrate that by giving us um, uh, a lot of money. Our, our, our revenue in Victoria is around about 42 million. Oh, wow. That comes from the community. Uh, and um, 10 percent, uh, around about 10 percent of it comes from government funding. That's around um, predominantly uh, providing funding towards the inspectorate, the law enforcement activities. And uh, and the rest of it is like around social enterprises. So our, our, our veterinary clinics, we run op shops um, yeah. and, and things like that. Yeah. Wow. OK. And um, I, I guess my other question was, so 2022 is when we're hoping that um, hens are removed from battery cages is that correct, correct. that's right yeah. well they won't the um it's a it's a it's a really big it's a very big industry and sure um uh and so it's a commitment to a phase out and in fact the phase out a complete phase out is unlikely to be until uh, uh about 2036 about 15 years mm -hmm. uh so but there's a, but certainly um you know we're hoping that uh a lot of that will be brought, will be brought yeah. forward. The industry, yeah. in fairness, the industry has to be given a chance to adapt because of the infrastructure associated uh, with the industry is enormous. For sure it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's a fantastic introduction, Liz. Thank you for that. Um, one of the things that I imagine happened during COVID is a lot of people sought out animals um, because they thought, oh, this is a good companion. Why don't we get a dog? I'm not going on a holiday now. I can get that cat or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, before people go down that road, um, before people think, you know, I might get a puppy, I might get a kitten, I might adopt a rabbit, a bird, whatever it is, what are some considerations people should take into account? So whether they're adopting either through the RSPCA or if they're buying, you know, a puppy or a kitten from a breeder? 
Yeah, so I think um, the first thing to ask yourself before you even go to how am I going to get this animal is, well, um, what sort of animal should I get? Uh, mm. Yeah, and you talked about the fact that, you know, you, you had landed on a rabbit. Rabbit makes, rabbits make great, great pets. And as you know, they can be litter box trained and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, so I think um, when, you, when you think about having an animal, um, understand why you want one. They're so good for you. They're good for your uh, mental health and well-being. They're good for your physical health as well and connection wonderful for kids too but you do have to just look at what your lifestyle is so if you do live in an apartment for instance um, you need to think about well how often will I be home how am I going to exercise this animal if it needs to be exercised um, what can I actually do so you know if you do live in an apartment you really want a dog you might you need probably one that uh, that you can commit to doing the right amount of exercise a greyhound uh, although big mm. can be good for apartments because they don't actually mm. need a whole lot of exercise um, uh, so think about your lifestyle. If you're going to be home, are you going to be able to meet that animal's needs? Uh, not only from an exercise point of view, but from a grooming point of view, uh, and all those other all those other enrichment points of points of view as well. Um, look at the costs for um, for what's what it's going to cost you. It is different. Mm. Uh, dogs are more expensive than cats uh, to maintain, uh, even to set up uh, mm. and then maintain. Um, and, uh, and then what are you going to do about what's your lifestyle look like in terms of going on holidays and what are you going to do about those sorts of things as well? And don't forget about um, the fact that whenever you bring an animal into your home, um, there's a period where everyone has to get used to each other and there's training to be done. And it is, um, you know, it's it's great fun, but it um, but it does require work. It's not a set, set and forget. So you do have to set aside some time to make sure that you can um, help that animal settle in well so that it really works for for the animal and for your family mm. there's I think there's so much to consider but I think if I can take away from that I would I would probably say just step back and consider your own lifestyle and how mm. the pet fits in around that I think if you have this kind of idealistic thing of oh well I saw this thing on Instagram or I saw my friend had one of these um, therefore I'll get one that might not actually work for you if you want to go you know travel every second weekend yeah. having a an animal that needs you every every day might not be the right yeah, choice. That's right. That's right. And yeah. I think you know things like um, yeah, if you if you if you like camping and you're always going to national parks, dogs are a problem. You're not allowed to take them there. And mm. I you know, and you shouldn't break the rules on that. There's really good reasons. There's there's good reasons for that. And in any case, that's just the rule. Um mm. and um uh so I think and so that's an issue. So maybe a, a cat or a rabbit might work. Um, where you can actually, um, you know, you can probably manage that a little bit better. If you have cats and you're uh, owning them responsibly, we really encourage people to contain them, which means keeping them inside um, uh, and, and perhaps having a cat run that is enclosed outside. In any case, you're up, you're up for litter boxes. So you're going to change the kitty litter, uh, you, know, you know, every day or two, depending on what your setup is. So, you know, there's work, there's work to be done and it does, it does take time and, and commitment to do all that. Mm. For sure it does. The other thing that we um, we don't really think about up front necessarily is the true cost of pet ownership. Mm. So we think about, oh, you know, it costs so much to buy this type of pet or, you know, we, we, we tend to think just in very simple terms, but there is a lot ongoing. Um, what are some of the costs involved with pet ownership? And you, you can be as specific as you want to one breed or one type of pet. Mm. Um, but what are some of the things that people should consider? Yeah, so I think... Um... Uh, you could probably chunk it down, I think, to, um, okay, so uh, what does it, what's the cost of actually purchasing the animal? Mm -hmm. uh, and we can talk about that in terms of adoption or breeders and how to go about doing that. Uh, and that, so, you know, the uh, average cost of, you know, adopting, a, you know, an animal from a, a shelter, um, you know, is probably somewhere between two and $400 or so. Those animals come... Uh, D6, microchipped, vaccinated, all those sorts of things. So it's an all-in type of um, yeah. it's an all-in type of cost. Um, so that's the that's the acquiring the animal, and then there's yeah. the what's the I suppose for want of a better word, what's the setup cost? You know, yeah. so um, so um, so the setup cost would be if you if you actually if you're not getting it from a shelter, you have to factor in vaccinations uh, and, and they're going to cost you 170 to $250. Uh, Desexing, you know, if it, that could be $200 to $500. So in that setup phase for dogs, you're probably looking at around um, about $1,000 because you've also got um, mm. a bed or a kennel. 
probably should get a car restraint, like a harness for them, um, collars and leashes and things like that. Uh, just dog bowls, things like flea control and worm control. Um, they're um, you know they're not insignificant expenses. Mm. They can be one hundred and twenty to three hundred dollars a year to actually get that to actually just do the maintenance. If you buy an animal that um, requires grooming, you need to factor that in too. Um, uh, the other sort of setup cost would be microchipping. So the setup things that I think about are the big costs are desexing, vaccination. Uh, microchipping, registering with the council, uh, and then making sure you've got the right infrastructure for the animal. So you've got a kennel if you mm. need it, or, or bedding and what have you, leads and, and those types of those types of things, and um, another allowance for extra veterinary fees around those flea and worm controls and what have you, and any treats because you do tend to get a bit excited and go off and buy all sorts of treats and balls and things, and that adds up too. So watch out. Uh, it, at the end of the day, for a dog. You're probably looking at a setup of around about a thousand dollars, and then on top of that, you've got the cost of the animal, and then you've got its food, and that's probably around, um, depending on the size of the animal, you know, five hundred to a thousand dollars a year to feed your animal. Mm. So, and then the ongoing costs would probably be around about um, nine hundred to a thousand dollars a year for a dog. It's a little bit less for a cat. Same sort of setup costs apply. For um, for the cat in terms of vaccination, desexing, microchipping, fleas and worms and what have you. So the first year is likely to be, um, uh, you know, probably around, uh, oh, probably around a thousand dollars again. It's probably not going to be too much mm -hmm. different. You probably conservatively should put a thousand dollars on it uh, annually. After that, you're probably looking at between eight and nine hundred for a cat. Yeah, right. Okay. So we're talking, it, it's clear that we're talking like thousands of dollars, yeah. Um, yeah. depending on which way you go, if you go cat or a dog. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can vouch for rabbits being quite expensive too, because they do re require, uh, if you got them inside, the, the litter trays, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the constant, you know, fresh hay and and food so and quite um, a bit of impost in terms of cleaning up and all those sorts of things too oh yeah absolutely the top cost of time yeah, yeah. so there, there's there's a lot involved and mm. when we talk about budgeting and and, and finances on the show mm. um we, we we talk about this thing Liz called a, an emergency fund which is basically mm. to put out you know financial fires if you like mm. so things like um cars breaking down needing you know to pay medical bills but i think one of the things that we lump into that without really thinking about it are pet mm. costs mm. i'm just interested are there any um i guess strategies that you see people using to deal with the, the cost of pet ownership um we can talk about pet insurance separately in mm. just a moment but is there anything i guess any tips that you have there for for listeners yeah i suppose my first tip um would be to do the basics well so um Okay. That preventative piece is really, really important. So don't skimp. You mustn't skimp on those puppy vaccinations. And if we've learned anything through COVID, it's the importance of vaccinations, <laughs> yeah. right? So, um, so you must get them vaccinated, um, uh, and for both for your cats and the dogs. If they get a um, preventable disease, um, it can it can result in really significant costs and even death. So parvovirus for dogs will kill your will kill mm. your puppy. Uh, it'll cost you thousands to treat them and uh, you are often emotionally on the hook and uh, it's really hard to, to pull back on, on a treatment uh, when, when that happens. So just prevent it happening in the first place. Follow the veterinary advice. Get them desexed um, uh, and get your cats desexed really early. They should be desexed. Uh, we advocate for early desexing uh, and that would be from around about three months of age. Um, and why is that, Liz? Like, why do you advocate for earlier desexing? For for cats, uh, for two reasons. Um, the main reason is they can start having babies at um, you know four or five months. Oh uh, wow! Okay. And you really don't. That's not safe for them. Uh, but we also don't need any more cats in Australia. I, yeah. I've already said I I love cats, but they are the they are the species that we have the most trouble with in terms of having an abundance of them. Yeah. Uh, and um, and issues with uh, with their welfare, their impact on wildlife and community well-being. So we really just need to be really careful with that. You know, so one cat, um, uh, one cat and her offspring over um, I think um, 
uh, five years can generate about 7,000 cats. So they're pretty good at reproducing. So get them <laughs> wow. desexed. Um, the other reason, uh, it's also very safe to desex um, cats when they're young. Uh, with dogs, um, they definitely need to be desexed too. We would normally say, um, uh, you know, when, when they're very young puppies, six months, when they're bigger breeds, it might be a bit longer. Um, either way, getting animals desexed is really important because um, uh, it's if if you're not a, if you're not a breeder and you don't know what you're doing, it's a risky business. Um, sure, they can get into all sorts of trouble. Very expensive. You could end up with a Caesar. You can end up with a dead dog. Um, it's it's a if you if it's a um, if it's a dog in particular, you're highly likely to get mammary cancer later on with that dog if you don't desex her if she's a female uh, and other testicular issues if it's a boy. Uh, and with girls in particular, if you don't desex them um, as they come into heat and what have you, um, they can actually get an infected um, uh, uterus and that, that's life-threatening as well. That's called a pyometra. Animals on heat also, um, uh, you know, they behave in different ways. Um, the, the dogs are really messy uh, and they also go off looking for... Um, um, mm -hmm. You know, the girls will um, be messy, but the boys will go off and looking, look, look for uh, um, hmm. females who are on heat. Uh, and then, then they get hit by cars and, you know, yep. all those sorts of, lots of reasons to get them desexed. So get the basics right, get them desexed, get them vaccinated, and you must get them microchipped because their microchip um, is, firstly, it's, it's requirement by the law, but it's their ticket home. So it's a tiny little... Um, uh, radio frequency identification device that goes in under their skin. Um, it's often done at desexing it, but it can be done while they're awake. It's not a big deal. Uh, then if they do get lost, the, the, the vet or the shelter can scan them. The number pops up. It's got your details in it. They just give you a call and say, come on down. Um, mm. So it really is their ticket home. It's linked to their council registration too. Mm. Um, yeah, the, and I, I think a lot of that, a lot of people figure out during the kind of or after the pet ownership phase. So they've, they've bought the animal and they think, oh, wow, look at all these costs. Um, they, they, there's the knowledge base on the RSPCA website where a lot of this information is stored. So uh, I'll put full links in the show notes so that okay. if you are thinking about getting an animal or you already have one, mm -hmm. uh, like I do, please go and check out the knowledge base. It is, it is really, really um, insightful. It covers all of these things. Um, I also noticed I'm going to wave the flag for my rabbit here. It's also really important to get your rabbit desexed for, for numerous health reasons, particularly as a female. Mm. That's what I've heard. I mean, you're the expert here, Liz, but that's, I'll just wave the flag. For Same reasons. Yeah, they're, they're very good at reproducing as well. Yep. Uh, and um, and I, I just think it's, um, uh, it's, it's really hard on the animals, especially if you don't know what you're doing. And, um, uh, you know, there are, there are issues for those animals to, you know, remain, remain, remain entire. Even, even for animals, like there's some really quirky things, not rabbits so much, but ferrets. If you don't get your female ferrets mm. uh, desexed and, you, and they, and they um, cycle and they're not mated, uh, they can develop a, um, a terminal anemia because their ovaries don't turn off and then it turns their blood, uh, bone marrow off. So there's some really quirky things oh, wow. going on. Um, fun facts, right? But um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think doing those basics, right, getting your animals desexed, it means um, it's, um, it's easier for you. It's better for their long-term health. Uh, and there's no, there's no negative impact on them. Everyone wins. The other thing I'd say in terms about um, thinking about how you... You know, manage those costs getting those basics right is sets you up for for success um, uh, the other thing that has evolved in the veterinary industry over the last few years which um, I think is fantastic is um, uh, uh, sort of like bundled a bundled service that you can buy from your vet so like membership right. packages uh, okay. and it's a bit like um, you know with your insurance you often you know if, if cash flow is a bit of an issue um, you know you can you can pay your insurance in monthly buckets. Yep. It's pretty much the same thing. And one of the challenges with um, veterinary fees or, you know, the veterinary costs that you have for animals is that it's really lumpy. Yeah, and you it comes might, all at once. Yeah. So you'll yeah. go to the vet, you'll get them vaccinated, you'll get a year's supply of, um, you know, flea and worm control and stuff, and you walk out with a bill for, you know, between three and $400 and you go, holy moly, I wasn't, even though if I had a thought about that, I would have known. It's a bit of a shock. Yeah. Um, so um, there's some really lovely packages that, um, that we've got, but lots of other practices have where you can bundle it up. And um, so, so for instance, um, at RSPCA, for um, a new puppy or a, or a senior dog, because um, they're both 
they both have different needs and it can be a bit costly, $60 mm -hmm. a month, so $720 a year. And for that, there's, you know, there's two consults, there's for the puppy, there's desexing, for the older dog, there's blood tests and what have you. So that preventative thing comes along, you get your worm tablets and your flea, your flea stuff all done. So you get the, the baseline stuff done. You have a check in there for the older animals so that if something is starting to give, you get onto it before it's a catastrophe. I think that's um, a really, and it's really budgetable, right? So, you know, it's a, you can say, oh, I've got $60 a month that's coming out. For um, for healthy, um, uh, for, you know, middle-aged healthy dogs, $30 a month. And for cats, it's it works out to be about um, $540 a year or $45 a month for new animals. And then um, about three, just over $300 for middle-aged cats and around $450 for older cats. So hmm. I think talking to your vets about what they might have so that um, it, it does lock you in, but you know, having a relationship with your veterinary practice is a really good idea. They have all the history of your animal. Uh, and then um, you know, you, you factored it in, you don't have to deal with the lumps and bumps. Of, uh, how, how, how long do those, so those are like a, I, I think if it's like a subscription or something yeah, like that, pretty much. how long do they, how long is the contract? So is that you know, measured in years or? Yeah, I think, that, yeah, I think my understanding, and I guess that'll be different and I'm not an expert on all those commercial terms, but it'd be a year. I think you'd yeah. sign up on, a, on an annual basis. Yeah, right. Okay. So that's, that's for a lot of people budgeting. Um, we love subscriptions, not because, mm. you know, if we forget about them, but just because they break down that lumpy cost. So mm. that's a really important thing. I didn't know that existed. So that's great. Um, so how about in terms of pet insurance? Mm. I think just even, you know, the basics here, there's a lot of people out there just kind of get their information from what they see on the tally or mm. um, what someone else is doing. What is pet insurance and how can we kind of navigate that? Yeah, so the reason that it's really important is that um, there's been a lot of, is the cost, it, the veterinary services, if your animal gets ill, um, the, the cost of it can go very high, mm. very quickly. Uh, I'm really, as a veterinarian and someone who, who um, loves veterinary science and thinks the work of our veterinarians is vital for this country, I'm loath to say that veterinary care is expensive because I don't think it is at all. Uh, the mm. challenge with, but the challenge is that there's no Medicare and we're so blessed in this country as a human, if you get sick, someone will look after you, um, you know, uh, more or less. Um, there is no, there's no vetty care. And yeah. so, um, you know, so, the, you know, if you have go to an emergency centre and your animal is critically ill, they would do very similar things to that animal to what they do to you if you were really sick. Mm. Uh, and you know that if you've ever seen your private hospital bills and what have you, that goes into the thousands of dollars very, very quickly. So you can rapidly, um, you can rapidly um, get a very large veterinary bill. You know, the, you won't get out of an emergency centre, you know, overnight for probably under fifteen hundred dollars because of that cost of the consult bloods, x-rays, IV fluids, all those sorts of things that they're going to be doing. Um, if your animal, and, and, and things happen, you know, the animal, your animal gets in and eats um, you know, half a kilogram of chocolate. You've got to, you, you, you can't, you, you don't have the luxury of waiting until tomorrow to go to, um, uh, you know, the local, but you've got to go now. You've got to get that, you've got to make your dog vomit and, and get it checked. Um, yeah. If your animal gets hit by, if your animal gets hit by a car, that's, Less common now because people are, are more responsible, but snake bites. Um, you can't mess around with those either. And antivenin uh, can cost thousands, just the antivenin right, before right. you even get to the treatment. So um, there's a lot of things that can happen, broken bones. And, of course, veterinary medicine um, has followed um, human medicine, and we can do so much more now. You know, we can CAT scan our animals and often we can do, even do MRIs on animals and really complex surgery and uh um, uh, complex cancer treatments as well, and mm. uh, and they come with a with a price tag and with some really good results. Uh, oftentimes, um, but that's why uh, pet insurance is important. And the other key thing about pet insurance, Owen, is that get in early because you you don't want to have pre existing. You want to avoid uh, yeah. pre existing diseases. So, um, mm. uh, yeah, that um, uh, that can be. Um, that can be a trap if you leave it for too 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 late. And pet insurance is still relatively immature in this country. There's only about seven percent of pet owners who have got it. Yeah, right. Yeah, and that's that's important that you bring that up, Liz, because I was doing some reading um, and I I did some investigation into this for myself. Mm. Um, 
how important it is to get early mm. on that cat or dog pet insurance because um, the pre-existing conditions, if there are any of those, they're often not covered. And those are the things you often won't cover for. So get basically get the insurance before those develop and yeah. become pre-existing. So um, the other thing I, I couldn't come across when I was doing my investigating was uh, pet insurance for rabbits. So I believe it's primarily, if I could be mistaken, for cats and dogs. Uh, is, yeah, look, is that correct? Coming on to do this podcast, I had the same sort of aha moment. Um, I think it is just cats and dogs, but I mm. will um, I'll come back to you and um, yeah. you, could, you can add it, in, add it in later in another podcast because I, I think it is predominantly cats and dogs. Yeah, I haven't, I have, I didn't come in across anything for my rabbit. And the reason, as I was, uh, you were saying, um, the cost of emergency, mm. uh, our rabbit itself, when we bought it from the breeder, it cost $50. Mm. But I estimate that we ended up spending about $2,000 in emergency bills because mm. it would eat chocolate. It would get things that it would just rummage through and find things that it shouldn't be eating. Like, I'm pretty sure the rabbit, I think it's a mission in life is to snip all of our phone charges as it goes around the house. Mm. And so I think it just gets sick from it biting all the cables. And we ended up taking it out of the hospital numerous times and it's not cheap. So um, the more insurance you can have for those unexpected things, the better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So how, how about in terms of then Liz, just getting a pet that fits our kind of our lifestyle and budget. So mm. the cost of adopting, is that a, a cheaper route for people? Like how can we, uh, you know, go about, I guess, minimising the cost, but also finding the right animal for us. Yeah, so we would always, um, you know, really encourage people to to look at adopting. You know, there's lots of really good reasons to adopt. So you're giving, you know, you are giving an animal a second chance. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the other thing is, though, that um, when you come through um, RSPCA or, or other, you know, other other shelters is that they've been... Um, They've been health checked and behaviour mm. checked, so you've got a reasonable, um, a reasonable understanding of the of the of what you're getting. Um, mm. You also get really good quality advice. So you know our team, the people who work in the shelters, love what they do. Happy to talk to you about what the requirements of different animals are and help you set up. Uh, and there will always be um, you know ongoing advice coming from from shelters around around specific animals. And RSPCA will help you regardless of where you got your animal from, quite frankly. But um, there's a lot. We, we, we have the background on animals um, and we know them. We try and get them toilet, toilet trained and what have you. Uh, and it certainly um, it helps with, um, you know, I suppose, um, reducing, the, reducing the demand on, um, on animals and just reducing oversupply, oversupply in For general. Sure. To be really honest, um, uh, uh, in Australia, uh, Australia at the moment, um, there's an abundance of cats available through shelters. Um, with dogs, it can be a little bit it can be a little bit harder to find the right one because uh, you have to balance, you know, what you what you can accommodate versus, um, um, you know, what's available at the shelter. With cats, mm -hmm. I would say I can think of no reason why you couldn't adopt a, a, a really suitable cat from a shelter. We've got thousands of them, and they're lovely, and we have young ones and old ones and, um, and and a reasonable variety of breeds at different times too. Um, with dogs, um, we still have a lot of dogs, probably a little bit less choice. So you do have to balance right. that up. But all those dogs, with all those animals that come from shelters are going to be de -sex. They're going to be vaccinated. They're going to be microchipped uh, and, and wormed and what have you. So though that annual, that set up cost that I, that I talked about, which might've mm. sounded a bit crass, um, that is vastly reduced. So um, instead of, having um you know nine hundred dollars plus the cost of your animal it's probably more like um the cost of the animal is um you know four hundred dollars and and there's probably only a few extra hundred dollars in terms of setting up your bedding and your, your leads and, and all those sorts of things so certainly um adopting is cheaper and and, and much better value and has that feel good um aspect mm, of actually giving an animal a second chance if you are going to but there's also nothing wrong if there's reasons um if you really want a particular breed or something like that i mean that's absolutely fine because animals do make our lives better and if you think mm. you've always wanted this type of animal you had it when you're a child a child you just have to uh, make sure you follow uh some really good steps so that you you don't fall into the trap of a uh, disreputable breeder yeah. uh, and they are they can be um they can be really savvy and be um, and quite manipulative with what you do. So I'd really recommend um, that people look at the uh, RSPCA Smart 
um, puppy and kitten buyer's guide. That's on on the website okay. too. I'm sure you can put that on the link. Yeah, so that takes that, that takes you through uh, what what you do. And um, one of the key things that you should do if you're going to buy from a breeder is visit the breeder. You really need to visit the breeder um, and um, uh, look at hopefully visit visit mum, visit dad if you can, um, as in mum and dad, the animals, um, uh, and and just satisfy yourself that. You know that they're in they're in good condition that they're you know they're clean they're well adjusted those animals should you know they shouldn't be fearful they should come towards you do their skin and their eyes look good do they do they look um, like they're a healthy weight and have they got enough space to you know to do their thing uh, and are they able to socialize with people and other other animals those sorts of things are really really important um, and then um, uh, make sure that you don't get an animal that's below eight weeks of age. Um, uh, in Victoria, um, we have a, a pet exchange register, uh, which means that anyone um, buying or selling an animal has to register uh, uh, what's called with a source code. It's um, it's unlawful to, to to sell an animal from an unregistered property. So it has to be a house, a, you know, a house or a um, you know a, a breeding facility or something like that. Um, uh, so if people try that on. So firstly, if you can't, if you're in Victoria, if there's no source code, then there's no sale. If they can't give you a source code, don't um, don't buy it. You can go onto the pet exchange register and validate that that's a that's the right source code for that for that area. Um, if you're worried, if you if you if you find an ad or something like that that you're worried about, or you go and see something that you're worried about, um, you should actually um, let RSPCA know because in every state and territory except for Northern Territory. Uh, we will be uh, enforcing uh, the law around that and, and action can be taken um, to make sure that those people are checked out and, and held to account. Um, never buy from, you know, I, I think you no, don't buy sight unseen. Uh, don't be, um, one, of the, one of the tricks with, that people used to use is um, they would say, oh, well, I know you're coming to pick up your puppy. If you, if you try and pick up the animal, and see the breeding facility all on the same day. That can be a trap. Um, it uh, and what that what some breeders will do is they'll say, "Oh, I know you're coming up on Saturday, but you know my auntie's sick in hospital, so I've got to come to Melbourne on that day. So I'll I'll meet you at the at right. the at the park or the Sunbury bus stop or something like that. One of the, uh, and we'll do the transfer there. That is a total red flag, and um, and you need to report that and back out from that. So mm. you've, got be, you've got to be really careful of that. And I imagine there's that a lot of people are desperate to get a pet, particularly a dog in this mm. environment because they're so expensive and mm. because of the rules changing around breeding, how hard it is to get a legitimate mm. animal. Mm. Um, so I imagine a lot of people get to that point and they've already committed to, okay, I'm picking up the dog today. Maybe the kids are excited. Mm. Maybe I'm excited. Um, and then that happens and you think all of a sudden, is this what am legitimate? I do? Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then what they'll, and so it is, um, you know, it's a, it's a really wonderful time uh, bringing a, a puppy in, which is why it's good to try and to, to go and see that place, you know, sure. before beforehand and to be, um, yeah, to be really, really, really careful about that. Having said that, Owen, there's, you know, um, because we enforce the law, it's fair to say that we focus on the people doing the wrong yeah. thing. There's a lot of people doing the right thing. So, sure um, yeah. so, um, and uh, uh, and there's some there's some people out there who are breeding really good animals, uh, you know, with love and um, and great care and expertise. Just follow the process and um, um, yeah. make sure that you do talk to people. And if people, um, uh, you know, people don't seem to be doing the right thing, then um, stop and re and um, and refer it to RSPCA. And I think. Um, and we'll we'll go and check it out, so the animals won't suffer. There is, um, I've heard cases where um, some really horrible stuff has happened. Where you know, if we can't meet us at the bus stop, then we'll probably have to put the animal down. You know, some really terrible emotional yeah, right. stuff okay. that goes yeah. on. So, um, um, set yourself up for success on that one. And uh, yeah, most people we're doing the right thing. There's some rogues out there um, uh, across the country. Um, we've got the best laws in Victoria around puppy farming. Uh, but there are people doing the wrong thing um, uh, or there will still be people doing the wrong thing. COVID's made that worse. Prices for puppies have probably doubled or tripled. Mm -hmm. um, and so you do have to be really, really mindful. Uh, the main thing is look at the RSPCA, 
Smart Puppy Buyer's Guide and, um, and follow that and you'll be right. Okay. Yeah, I'll put full links to that in the show notes. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, maybe just you've, you've, you've got so much experience in this, Liz. Um, just some maybe some tips for people that have pets already, mm. um, some ways to keep those costs down, whether they're, you know, when you go on holidays, you've got to get kenneling. Um, mm. If there's like for health, you've already mentioned that bundling the veterinary services, mm. if your vet offers that sounds fantastic. Mm. Even grooming, like anything there that you can say, even no matter how small those tips might be, uh, to help people keep those costs more manageable. Yeah, look, so I think that, so the bundling is a really good option, getting the, getting the basic stuff done first, bundle it up. Um, I would um, use the use the knowledge base uh, information. We've also got information on on uh, RSPCA's have different information on their on their websites. You can make in terms in terms of enrichment toys and what have you for yeah. for uh, for your animals. You can make them. Yeah. So um, so if you've got a dog, for instance, uh, a good example is snuffle mats. I just like saying snuffle mats myself. <laughs> but so some of these some dogs I've got a Labrador eat really fast. You know, and and that's not very good for them. And, um, you know, it's, they, they need to slow down. So you can get microfiber things, make a snuffle mat, put your food in that, and then they have to snuffle through it to find it. <laughs> or you could go and spend $35 on a, on a fancy box, you know, so yep. that you can make it. So use, um, uh, use our resources to, to make some of the enrichment toys and what have you. Um, I think the other, um, uh, the other thing is you can, there's lots of information on how you can, um, um, you know, care for your animals. Some some dogs that need grooming, um, uh, you can you can train yourself up to do the basics. Um, I'd be I just make sure you might want to do a little course uh, mm. or do something at RSPCA. Uh, during COVID, people did some damage to themselves and their animals when grooming was a problem. Right. Uh, so I think you probably can. Um, uh, you do make sure you can do the basics for the grooming yourself, so you minimise what the external uh, grooming costs might be. Um, so I think that's really important. If you go on um, holidays, um, start to plan that and build your networks. I think that the community mm-hmm. communities are really supportive around that, um, and you can get people to look after your animals. You can get them to come into your home to look after your animals. That's a really good solution for animals if you don't have to. Um, if you don't have to disrupt them when you're going on holidays, it's what I do. I get someone to come and stay in my house. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, um, older teenagers that are looking for a bit of an escape from their parents mm-hmm. might come and stay at your house and you might be able to do that very cheaply or for free. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's a really, really good solution for everyone. Uh, and, and things that you, you might pay for, like if, if you can, you don't have to pay for someone to walk your dog, just walk your dog yourself. Yeah. Um, so I think it's good those for you too. Be, Oh, it, it's great. And, it, you know, it's great for your cardiovascular health, great, great for your steps, great for your mind. And there's some wonderful data that, you know, shows that, you know, people with um, cardiovascular disease that have mm. a dog um, live longer and, and recover better than people who don't. Mm. So walk yeah, the well. dog. Walk the dog. Mm. So I think, I think there, um, there's some really, really good tips. Make things, do the prevention stuff really well uh, and, and use your networks to help care for them if you, if you need to go away. Mm. I know that there are some fantastic Facebook groups and, and communities online that people can join too, particularly for individual breeds. If you're, if you're very much in love with the breed that you have of your cat or your dog, join those communities because there might be someone near you as well. And yeah. the vets might know someone or a group near you as well, where if you go away, they can help you by taking care of the animal. And if they go away, you know, you repay that favor. So I think that's a really important one because a lot of people are put off adopting a pet uh, because they think oh i'm gonna i want to go on holidays and how am i going to manage that and and so you know there are ways that you can solve that problem um i've got two more questions here for you liz the first is just um what i guess for people that might be struggling with the the costs of a of having a pet Mm -hmm. what resources uh would you recommend are you know are available to people to seek out um so if they've already got an animal and they're struggling with the expenses yeah Mm. look i really encourage people to um um, speak to their uh, speak to their local shelters, especially RSPCA's. We will do we'll do um, whatever we can to help, uh, mm-hmm. and we will help people. Um, you know, if you just if you're experiencing some hardship that's you know that's temporary, we can we'd love, we will help. Um, we do that through our community outreach programs too. Um, we can. There are other organisations. Uh, 
in, in just about every state that I can think of, especially Melbourne and, uh, and Sydney, um, where there are charities that will help with some um, veterinary services uh, mm -hmm. at reduced fees, like Robert Smith Animal Hospital in, um, uh, in Melbourne, as, as well as, as we will help as well. Um, the other thing that you can do is um, um, if, if it is getting really, really hard and you don't know what to do in life and you're overwhelmed by life in general, and, and that does happen, um, is um, can, you can consider surrendering your animal, and that's a heartbreaking decision, uh, but you can do that in the confidence that we'll, you know, we'll mm. look at your animals, you know, and your home, you know, fix anything that, that needs to be fixed. Our preference would always be to try and keep them with you if we can, um, uh, as long as you can, um, you, you can support them going on mm. into the into the future. I'd certainly reach out for help because sometimes there are some really um, uh, there's some quick fixes that you might not, you know, in all the stress of struggling, you might not realize that that can be done. Mm. And it's, it's such a, it a secret. Yeah, it's such a yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point. Um, it's such a gut wrenching feeling if you think that you might have to give up an animal, but um, at the same time, there might be ways that you know you can you can help them solve that problem. Mm. Um, so definitely reach out, reach out to the resources. I think that's again why it's really good to build a community of people around you who mm. understand pet ownership as well. So. Mm it's not just you against, you know, everything yeah. else. And remember the pet brings so much happiness. So I think that's yeah, and really we know they're really point. good for you. Like we've had some examples where people have come in and um, said, um, you know, this animals, I can't keep this dog because I can't, I, it's just, um, it, it, it's not behaving itself. And yeah. so we missed the boat on, um, on, on training the animal. Well, we can, you know, there's some lovely stories where we've said, well, what about if we help you with training the animal and we mm. just get you back on track? Mm. Uh, and that's a really good example too. That's something that we didn't talk about earlier too, Owen, just in terms of having a new pet is um, uh, and setting yourself up for success is actually um, don't forget that socialisation and training and behaviour mm. piece um, because um, having a well-behaved animal in your home and also out if it's a dog out in the community um, uh, is really valuable. Now, sure. some animals are... Um, um, some animals are, um, um, you know, a bit like people. They might be more anxious than others, and we always have to accommodate their that, needs yeah. uh, out in out in the community. But making sure that they can walk on a lead and that they are um, socialised with other animals um, is, is really helpful. And if they're not understanding their limitations, so you don't put them you don't put them under pressure. Mm. And I and I I've got to say that going to a dog park, if you do have a dog park near you, you should look it up because there typically is in most in most big suburbs. Mm -hmm. um, you can go and you can take your dog, and there might be dozens of other dogs there. And if they can socialise together, they're going to have a better life. You're going to enjoy yourself more. Yeah. Um, go and check that out because it, it it just it makes everyone's life a lot easier. Um, what one, one final question I've got here for you, Liz, which is just. Um, you know, how can people find out more about what the RSPCA is doing? Mm -hmm. um, how can they learn more from you, the experts throughout mm -hmm. Australia on how to manage pets, find pets, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, just generally care for themselves as well? Yeah, so I think the um, uh, through those knowledge-based articles that I know you're going to post, there's, a, there's a, mm -hmm. an abundance of information there. Uh, and in addition to that, I'd really encourage people to contact their, their RSPCA's in their own states. Mm -hmm. uh, animal welfare legislation and rules is pretty much the same across the country, but it is state-based. So it's really helpful to okay. go to your local um, RSPCA and they will always help you just to answer some questions or point you towards some resources that they can uh, they can assist you with. They'll also know what the local support networks look like uh, that yep. might be available uh, in your areas. I know that my colleagues in New South Wales run um, a really big community outreach program and in Victoria Westall we've got some of that going on but we're not nearly as mature as New South Wales every every RSPCA and every state and territory is slightly different uh, okay. but they do understand um, that that environment really really well and be able to and we'll be able to connect you to um, you know to the right to the right people and the right information Wonderful. The websites are also really good too. So, um, you know, check out those websites as well. Yeah, for sure. I'll put all the links in the show notes. There'll also be links in there to learn more about pet insurance. If you haven't already got that, as Liz said, that it's only about 7% of people have mm. pet insurance. So please go check that out. Um, and I will, if you're interested um, and you're a regular listener of the Australian in, uh, Finance Podcast, jump into our Facebook community because I will post a, a, a short video of my rabbit 
uh, Marley. She is a handful. She's very cute. Um, Liz, one thing about Marley is she she's a bit of a terror. Sometimes she doesn't like to be around us. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll have to speak to you afterwards about trying to find out how I can get my rabbit to love me more. But um... <laughs> they make they make wonderful pets. We've got some real um, rabbit aficionados uh, at RSPCA Victoria who. Um, who um you know devote their lives to them they love them they're terrific they've got great personalities don't they they? Do. they do yeah it's not just what you think they can be litter trained and everything so if you go down to your to your local rspca you will be able to see heaps of animals that are up for adoption so as well as you know typically buy all of your, your pets needs there so yeah. go and check that out and support the rspca too so dr liz walker thank you so much for joining me on the show my pleasure thanks so much Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast, where our mission is to improve the financial futures of all Australians. If you'd like to learn more, create a free account at rusk.com.au forward slash account to download free episode workbooks, bonus resources, and take our amazing free personal finance courses. You can also join our online community by following the link in the description. If you enjoyed the show, what we'd love is for you to leave us a snappy review on iTunes. And you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Rask Australia. Kate and I are also on both of those channels. Finally, if you have any feedback, suggestions for episodes or guests to come on the show, or you just have a question for us, shoot us an email at podcast at rask.com.au. This podcast was proudly sponsored by InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginner Investors. Build your investing confidence for only $49.50. Learn what it takes to be a successful investor with InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginners. This online course is self-paced over three months with live weekly webinars designed to help you achieve your financial goals and create wealth. To start your investing journey today, head to investsmart.com.au bootcamp or simply click the link in your podcast player.